Hi, David Vizard here, and you are watching Paratech 10. Before we get cranked up on this episode, which will be episode 27, um, and before I get to the subject, I want to continue what I did in my last video by giving you details of the book that I'm just reviewing. So here we go. Here's the book. You can check it out in episode 26. It's all handwritten. The entire book is handwritten. I'm hoping you can see that all right. And the guy that wrote it is from Norway. Um, I've got to page 15 at the moment. Um, and you'll see I'm using a magnifying glass. That's not because it's hard to read. It's because I need one. Anyway, so far so good. Um, in the first 15 pages, what we get is a, a, a rundown on the author's um, background and, and life. And it starts into uh, engine uh, technology, not as a rebuild or anything like that, but basic things that you need to know, like you know, how's horsepower calculated and you know how, how to hone blocks and things like this. So it's very good to give what I've re read so far, it is proving very good to give the reader an overall um, idea of what it takes to machine a block or crank or whatever to get it ready for building. So at this point this book is so far so good. Well so much for our intro. Now let's get down to the topic in question here. It's one that's going to take me quite a while to go through because I think that I should start off at square one. But essentially, the subject matter is how to build a zero power loss, street legal, in terms of sound, exhaust system. Now, I'm sure you've been told many times that it's not possible. Well, it obviously isn't possible with people who don't have the know-how, but I can tell you from first-hand experience, it is. And it's not that hard to do. So, where shall I start? Okay, let's go back to my mini days, right? My God, we are going back a while. Whilst I was doing my big mini book, that's it's a 500... A series engine build book. It's a 528 page book. Um, <clears throat> we needed to build some stout street motors and one of the big problems with these engines is that mufflers that were available for them simply killed 10 horsepower. Now if you've got a big honking V8 that's no big deal. right? 10 horsepower off say 550 you wouldn't notice it. But when you've got an engine which is say 100 horsepower and you reduce it to 90, then that's starting to be something that you need to concern yourself with. So what happened here is whilst I was writing the book, I had a friend of mine who worked in a big muffler factory, big, biggest in Europe. He was chief engineer there. And uh, I talked to him about what we could do about designing a muffler for the A-series engine and specifically for the original Mini. Well, we did just that. We designed one that if you had a Mini which made 110 at the wheels, and that's a pretty stout Mini, on open exhaust and you put this muffler on, it made exactly the same power with it on but it was totally street legal. I don't mean barely street legal, it was quiet. So what this told me back then is that mufflers aren't designed with power in mind consistent with the muffling. They're mostly designed 
to just choke up the engine and get the job done as cheaply as possible. There are some abysmal mufflers out on the market. Now let's fast forward a while. Back in the mid 70s I lived in Tucson and um, I bought myself a nice uh, Chevy powered Pontiac Trans Am. Um, it had the California spec 305 Chevy in it which was chronically underperforming. Anyway, um, so I decided to build a 350. And of course, this wouldn't be hard to do because I'd read all these stories in Hot Rod Magazine and, uh, and the like, and they gave some pretty good information on it, or so I thought. So basically following information that I'd read about in magazines, I built a 350, ported the heads on it, etc., 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 and put it on the dyno, and it made a paltry 350 horsepower. Now I was expecting at least a hundred more than that. Um, I finally got that extra hundred horsepower. But when I bought some turbo mufflers, guess what? They were turbo in name only. There was no performance aspect about them at all. They choked up the engine killed about 25 to 30 horsepower. This was not what I was expecting. So I sawed the muffler up. Well, I also bought a spare one to put on the flow bench, but I sawed up the mufflers we had and looked at them, and I was horrified by the design. Now, I don't have muffler design experience. I'm just a plain old ordinary engineer, right? I've got a degree in mechanical engineering uh, uh, but it doesn't cover mufflers so I have to think my way through muffler design right so anyway what I did was I teamed up with my friend in England and we designed uh, a muffler he did the acoustics for it I did the airflow right and uh, we came out with a muffler um, that we tried on the engine and uh, a pair of them and uh, dynoed the engine and sure enough managed to have a zero power loss with these mufflers on and it was reasonably quiet wasn't perfect at this stage but that was a prototype anyway as luck would have it the boss of a large muffler company and I'll think of the name in a minute, that's brain fade again, happened to come in the day after we were dyno testing, happened to come into the dyno shop that I was using. And um, the boss there told him, hey, David's got a new muffler here that works very well. It's zero power loss and pretty much noise legal, right? Really? Um, he says, uh, uh, if you can demonstrate that, I'll buy, buy the design off you. So, hey, we demoed the muffler. And sure enough, he right there and then wrote out a formal agreement to buy the design so long as it carried through to the production one. Bit of a snag, we had to put our design into a smaller case which is never good but we managed to do it now there's a story attached to this that's what I'm going to tell you about next on the basis of this test with our two mufflers on the, my uh, transam engine we kind of went ahead and designed a muffler that would fit in their case now this was smaller than the one we had uh, originally uh, done. Um, it was a pretty small one. But anyway, we managed to make it work. And the first one we came out with was a two and a quarter inch one. Well, about that time, there was rumors that Hot Rod was going to do a muffler test. And 
I kind of played it close to the wind here just to make things happen a bit quicker I decided to uh, kind of drop a hint to the then editor of Hot Rob magazine uh, Leonard Emanuelson good friend of mine from way back when that I was going to do one so he, just to beat me to the draw he sped up the the tests now here's the problem Gail Banks was going to run these tests and he was going to run a big block Chevy through a single two and a half inch muffler. Do everything that was out there. Now the problem was we only had a two and a quarter. And I remember the boss at uh, the muffler company called me up and said, uh, what are we going to do? And I said, just swedge open the uh, intake and exhaust so it's two and a half. Right? He says, but the guts are still two and a quarter. I said, yes, but those other mufflers aren't very good so I think our two and a quarter one would beat everybody's two and a half well it did I was not going to run a muffler test but Leonard sped things up and sure enough Gail Banks did this test and our muffler came out number one now then Lenny did not know that I had designed that and that was a deliberate move on my part not to let him know because that would have probably have stopped him from testing the muffler for the simple reason that he didn't want to appear biased. Now then, that muffler came out under the name of Sonic Turbo. My friend and I got about seven or eight patents on that and it hung around as number one out there for years and years and years. And then Cyclone, that was the name of the company, got bought out by Walker and the first thing they did was to bring out a muffler which used some of the same concepts although it did not infringe the patents and um, uh, it actually produced a slightly better muffler but it was in a bigger case now what happened from there on is that Walker stop production of my muffler I say my muffler our muffler and um, uh, things kind of went dry in the muffler department as far as my life was concerned so I was quite surprised when the PR guy I think it was from Walker called up and asked if I would like to be a consultant for them because they wanted to do some power versus flow testing right so I agreed to do that and, uh, and it's quite a lengthy process what I did was I started off with a mini engine a, a British Leyland A series engine as was in the original Mini Cooper and I used a super trap muffler to vary the back pressure to find out how much flow was needed per horsepower that was shown on open exhaust. Now, something I've got to tell you here, a little story about the Super Trap muffler, right? It's a piece of garbage. Basically, you cannot, using a Super Trap, you cannot dial in horsepower and dial out noise. You either dial out noise and dial out horsepower, or you dial in noise and dial in horsepower, but you can't do one and the other right so it's an excellent bit of marketing and the only thing it really traps is the dollar in your wallet in their bank account so um, anyway a little again a side to a side story um, while I was at PRI the uh, guy that was the PR man for super trap spotted me and called me over and says hey Mr. Bizard all that negative stuff you're writing about our muffler is going to ruin your reputation. And I said, oh, really? I, all I'm writing is what the dyno tells me. And he says, yes. He said, we all know that you can tune around those problems that you're showing. And I said, really? So I tell you what, come and show me how it's done because damned if I know. Well, of course, he wasn't expecting that usually the deal is with a lot of engine builders they have egos that won't allow them to admit they don't know something 
I don't have that problem. That's why I get to learn so much because as soon as I don't know something, I start to find out about it. And there's lots I don't know. That's why I spend so much time reading physics books and the like. But anyway, what it did, that super trap did is allow me to start working on how much flow was needed in the exhaust system per open exhaust, uh, horse, open exhaust horsepower. And it turns out that if you've got 2.3 CFM of flow at 20.3 inches, I think it is, it's one and a half inches of mercury, same as calibration as a carburetor, then the amount of power lost to back pressure resistance is not measurable on a dyno. The flow numbers that I derived using the super trap muffler as a flow restriction. This is the horsepower curve. This is the back pressure curve. You can see as back pressure drops, horsepower goes up. This is the percentage of peak horsepower. By the time we get to about here, there are no measurable gains to be seen. You'll see along here virtually 100% of our power. Does the system need back pressure? No, that's total BS. Oh, and by the way, if anyone tells you, well, an exhaust system needs some back pressure, They don't know what they're talking about. I, I'm lost for words, right? That's unusual. But um, anyway, the thing is, is that's, that's it. Now, that takes care of the back pressure. But with exhaust systems, we've got other things to consider, like tuned lengths. It's already bad enough that practically every header you get out there is wrong. And I say practically, I'm kind of covering my butt here, right? I'd probably be more accurate to say that every one of them is wrong. Uh, but we'll get down to that on another um, uh, a video. What I need to say now is, oh, in case I forget, here's another one. The greatest marketing uh, name of any product on the face of the planet and it's managed to sell a product which is, does not do what its name says, and that is Flowmaster. They do not master flow. And I don't believe they're very good muffler designers either, because I've been looking at one of their principal products now for, I don't know, 25, 30 years. And there's a five cent change they can make on it that will up the power and cut the noise and they've never figured it out, right? So, no, I don't think they know much about mufflers. Anyway, here's the deal. At this point, we're now in a situation where engine power is not lost by um, back pressure if the muffler has 2.3 CFM of flow per open header horsepower. Right? Now, if you've got a 500 horsepower V8, then, then each muffler has to deal with about 250 horsepower. So 250 horsepower times 2.3 will give you the amount of flow that that muffler needs. But we've got to take care of one more thing. Tuned lengths, right? I got onto that and I kind of wandered off. Tuned lengths. If we use something that represents open air, like a large expanse on the end of a collector, which is tuned, then the tuned length won't be altered much because when the pressure wave hits the muffler box, if it's big enough and empty enough, like a Flowmaster, it will think that it's reached open air 
and it will reflect a pressure wave just as if that Flowmaster wasn't there. It's very important to understand the characteristics of the exhaust system, especially in terms of its pressure wave reflection. Here we've got a Flowmaster style manifold. It tends to look like this here and it reacts like this here. Here's a straight through glass pack. It looks and reacts like this here. Now there's a great deal of difference. What we've got with the glass pack is we've extended the tuned length of the exhaust system to probably an incorrect length. Sure, it may have a lot of flow, but now the tune length is wrong. Here, maybe not so much flow, but the tuned length is correct. So now, think of this, and this has been done by many a magazine. They flow tested a Flowmaster and they flow tested a straight through glass pack. The glass pack flows way more than the Flowmaster, but the Flowmaster makes more horsepower. And when they check at the back pressure, if they ever get that far, they find that the Flowmaster has more back pressure. And this is where that story comes from. Well, you've got to have a bit of back pressure to make it work. No. What you've done here is you've killed one aspect of making horsepower, but enhanced or saved another. When we have uh, a muffled system on a race car, we need the headers to come around into a termination box. That needs to be at least eight times the volume of one cylinder. What you see here is the basis of a zero loss muffled system. Ideal setup here. Exhaust comes into a termination box right this is the ideal shape for it here as the exhaust comes in hits open air here pressure wave reflected and has an easy path down through the pipe it then goes into a muffler which has adequate flow i.e. 2.3 cfm per open exhaust horsepower right what we can do is simplify it. Oh, this is a balance tube. We can have this one or this one. This here is preferable. This also can work. Tuned length goes into an open muffler, nothing in it. Balance tube. That goes into a pipe with a streamlined entry so that there's no hang up of flow there or minimized because that 2.3 cfm has to start 2.3 cfm per horsepower that is has to start here and it goes through the muffler so that's what we need and what happens is the pressure wave comes out the the uh, collector comes into this termination box which is principally empty and reflects straight back up as if it's nothing's there right now the exhaust goes on out and it now arrives at a muffler which has 2.3 cfm per horsepower right so now it doesn't see back pressure so what we've done here with a terminator box and a muffler is we have created a means of reflecting the pressure wave just as if it was open air and a means of suppressing the noise without inhibiting the flow. Net result, open header power, street legal noise. Okay, let me show you a few examples on this. So we'll do that next. Here's the Walker muffler that sort of replaced my muffler. You can see the technique that they're using here. This steers, 
this kind of scoop here steers the gases round a corner into here, round here, and out. Works pretty good. Let's look at the next one. Now, this is a Flowmaster. This particular one flows quite well. Doesn't muffle very well though. Now here's a Magnum uh, muffler. Straight through steel wool glass pack muffler and a stainless steel pack. Works pretty good. This is theory put into practice. Here's an exhaust system that was done for a Corvette. Tuned length headers here, merge collectors. Here's the tuned length secondary pipe going into a big pressure wave termination box. Comes out. Oh, this is a common box, by the way, for both ones. Uh, comes out, goes through the mufflers. 1700 CFM total flow, 704 horsepower at 7100 before, 704 after, 608 pounds feet before, 608 after. Can't ask for much more than that. Well, it's been a few hectic days since I filmed the intro. Mostly hunting down these characters here. These are the pipes that I use to flow test mufflers on my flow bench. Here's a couple of my students from the University of North Carolina. Here we are flow testing a Borla muffler. Incidentally, Borla has some very nice high flow mufflers, so you need to check them out. But my point here is that everything that goes on the exhaust system needs to be flow checked, right? Not many muffler manufacturers other than Walker are quoting flow figures. Well, there we have it. That's about all you need to know to actually build a zero loss exhaust system. How effective can it be? Well, using these principles, we could muffle a pro stock right down to about street noise levels and probably only lose 5 or 10 horsepower out of the 1500 or so that they have. Would it work on a top fuel car? Well, hell no. Uh, but why would you want it to? In fact, why would you want to muffle a pro stock engine? Sounds beautiful to me. Mechanical music. Anyway, before I leave, I'd like to ask you to like and subscribe and comment. Uh, we do like your input, so hey, I'm busy giving you my thoughts on things. Let's have yours. Thank you for watching.